Okay, the Torah portion this week is Kaye Sarah, which means the life of Sarah. It's found in Genesis 23, verse 1, to chapter 25, verse 18. The Haftar portion is 1 Kings 1, 1 through 31. And the Brit Hadashah portion is Matthew chapter 2, verse 1 through 23. And first we'll take a look at the pictograms and the gematria on, on the title of the Torah portion, Kaye Sarah. And we'll see how it's actually a picture of this Torah portion, and it's actually a picture of Yeshua too, because Yeshua's gonna, Yeshua will be more or less seen in the characters in the Torah portion. So, the first letter we have in, is Kaye, which means life, Kaim is life, if you remember, it's the letter Chet, and the letter Yud, it adds up to 18, and that's the gematria for life. Um, the letter Chet is the number 8. And um, what's the number 8? New beginning. New beginning. A new beginning. And what, do we, what will we see in this Torah portion? One matriarch goes out and another matri one comes in. Okay, so Angela says one matriarch goes out and another matriarch comes in. And we're about to start a new generation, right? Mm -hmm. And the letter Chet is a wall and it means to divide. And all through this Torah portion you'll see also that as the Torah portion goes on, there's actually a division between the righteous people and the unrighteous people in the, in the fact that Abraham sends his servant to a certain place because he wants what? He, he wants a godly woman for his son, right? Mm -hmm. And we'll get into that more later. The next two letters in the word Kaye or the letter Yud, which is a hand and an arm that represents work. And we've gone through this many times before. It's a picture of Yeshua. You can see it also in the letter Ket. It's a picture of Yeshua because he's the one that's going to come and judge and divide the sheep and the goats. Uh, he's also the creator. You can compare Genesis chapter 1 with John chapter 1 and also Colossians chapter 1 verse 15 to 18. The letter Yud is the number 10. Okay, and we have what? The 10 words, the 10 commandments. You have the number 10 for a minion. You have the number 10. Abraham was tried 10 times, and the children of Israel tried God 10 times in the wilderness. And the number 10 occurs many times all throughout the Bible. You add up the first word, Kaye, it adds up to 28, you add up the digits, it goes back to 10, which goes back to the 10 words again. The number 2 is the two tablets, and we come back, we have the number 8 again, which is the new beginning that we just talked about. You go to the word Sarah, and it starts with the letter Seen, which is... When you go back to the original, it's two teeth, that means to devour, but it also represents the two tablets. And the letter Shin represents who? Hashem, right? It's a sin, right? Hashem. It's a sin, not Shin. Yeah, it's a sin, not a Shin, but it's still shaped the same. The yeah. pictogram is still the same. Oh, okay. The pictogram is still the same. The resh is the head. And we know that Yeshua is the head. And it talks about that back in Colossians chapter 1. And the letter he is a man with his arms raised that means to behold. Behold. And so what does this say? It says, behold the head who is Hashem. Okay, so we're talking about the head is Hashem, and we're supposed to behold Hashem. And that's what Sarah's life was all about, was that she beheld 
Hashem, God, all the time. Because, because it says in the Torah portion that she was totally pure and innocent, right? And we'll see that in the Torah portion when we start out. No, Angela has a whole bunch of notes, and, and we'll get to that in a minute. Okay, we have the word Sarah. The word Sarah adds up to 505 in the Gematria, which also adds up to 10. That goes back to the 10 words again. The 5 is grace, and the 0 is eternity. And so what do we have if we obey the commandments, if we've received Yeshua HaMashiach, HaMashiach as our Savior? Okay, we have what? Eternal life, zero represents eternity. The three over here represents the Father, the Son, and the Spirit. And we'll see a picture of that when we get into the Torah portion, the picture of Eliezer and Isaac and Abraham. And we'll see a picture there when we go to the Torah portion. So we'll leave this and we'll start the Torah portion now. So let's go to Genesis 23, verse 1. And we'll have... Angela Stark, Genesis 23, verse 1 through 4. <clears throat> okay. Sarah lived to be 127 years old. These were, these were the years of Sarah's life. Sarah died in Kiryat Arba, also known as Hebron in the land of Canaan, and Abraham mm -hmm. came to mourn Sarah and weep for her. Then he got up from his dead one and said to the sons of Het, I am a foreigner living as an alien with you. Let me have a burial site with you so I can bury my dead wife. Okay. So now, in your translation there, it says 127 years old, right? Yeah, but, but it's But what does it here. say in the Kumash, um, Angela? Let me see. You probably have it open on it. No, that's all right. Okay. That's all right. You go ahead, go ahead to yours. Um, and if you have some notes there, you can tell us about it. Um, and I believe this is very important. Because yeah, it, it, shows, it shows a difference in how the scripture is translated. Sarah's timeline was 100 years, 20 years, and 7 years, the years of Sarah's life. Okay, we'll stop there now. Yeah. Okay, do you want to explain that for us? Yeah, go for it. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I could read what it says here, okay, go ahead but I that. haven't done that. No, okay. go ahead and do that. I just noticed it was different. Okay. 100 years, 20 years, and 7 years, Rashi explains that the repetition of years divides Sarah's life into three periods, each with its own uniqueness, and each period shared with the particular characteristic of its neighbor. At 100, she was as sinless as a 20-year-old, for until the age of 20, a person does not suffer heavenly punishment. At 20... She still had the wholesome beauty of a seven-year-old who does not use cosmetics or whose beauty is natural. Um, I don't know what that name is, but commented that a child's beauty is pure and is never used to tempt others to go astray. Part of Sarah's greatness was that despite her breathtaking beauty as an adult, who all who saw her recognized her purity and innocence. Okay, that so, is beautiful. Yeah, so everybody recognized Sarah's innocence and beauty. And look how we bless, bless our children in the tabernacle. Mm -hmm. And and so and so you'll see that you know like Ab Abraham you know like did different things but it never says that Sarah did anything like that right no, was Sarah was pure and innocent for her whole life okay now we go to verse 2 
And so Sarah died in Kiriath Arba, which is Hebron, in the land of Canaan. And Abraham came to eulogize Sarah and to bewail her. Now, when did Sarah, where, was, where were Abraham and Isaac when Sarah died? Tell us. Be huh? Tell us. Okay. <laughs> Abraham went to go sacrifice Isaac. Okay, and during the time that Abraham went to go make the sacrifice, follow That's God's when, call, that during that time was when Sarah died, was while Abraham and Isaac were gone to go up to the mountain. And she died before they came back. Now what did she happened? Know? Huh? Did she know what he was going to do? Well, some people say, and I, and I don't agree with this, some people say that Satan came to tempt Sarah and said that Abraham actually sacrificed Isaac, and that's what caused her death. But I don't agree with that. Because Sarah was a pure, innocent, and holy person, and I don't believe she would have felt fallen for something like that. She would have known because the Spirit would have revealed it to her that it was a lie. But I believe that according to Scripture that at 127 years old that it was just her time. Her time came to die and go be with Hashem. And actually, if you take a look at this too, the 127, okay, if we take this 127, it's 10. you have Hashem, you have the two tablets, you have the seven, which is completion. Because it was the completion of her life, and it adds up to ten, which is uh, one is Hashem, and zero is eternity. So when Sarah's life was complete, she went to go spend eternity with Hashem. So that, that was just her time. Her time was up. Now, there's something else about Kiryat Arba, which is Hebron. And, and if you look into that, actually, it's called the, the uh, Kiryat Arba, or the city of Arba, which means the city of the four giants. So. And later on, it was also known as Hebron, but it was the city of the four giants, and according to Aben Ezra, it was named for Arba, a great man among the Anakims, the father of Anak, and they were the giants. And, but there's another reason why they call it the, the city of four, um, and they talk about great people, but there's great people that ended up being buried there, and who were they? Um, Adam and Eve, okay. Abraham and Sarah, Isaac and Rebecca, and Jacob and Leah. And Jacob and Leah. So there were four... What? The patriarchs and the matriarchs wow. are all buried at Hebron. And that's why that's such an important city. Another thing about this is, like modern day, is that the city of Hebron is in the land that belongs to the tribe of Judah, and it's only 22 miles from Jerusalem. It's only 22 miles from Jerusalem, and right now it's a hotbed of problems, you know, because of the other people that are there. It's very small Jewish. I mean, yeah, there's a very small Jewish population, mm -hmm. and the Arab population, Palestinian population around there is very, very huge. Mm -hmm. And they won't even let them build a home. No, and we know 
you know, like we know several people that live down in that area. And, and it's a very rough area to live in because when you travel from Hebron to, to Jerusalem, sometimes the cars are shot at, they throw rocks at it, they, sometimes people are attacked, and, and it's a very hard place to be. Okay, now we continue on in verse 3. Abraham rose up from the presence of his dead and spoke to the children of Heth. Now it says in here that there's a small letter in the word vali, vali, uh, kota, and it's a small letter kaf, and they say that represents that when Sarah died, that Abraham didn't make a big outward grief type showing about Sarah's death, but that he mainly mourned inside because of Sarah's death. He didn't want to make a great big show out of it. And I believe basically he wanted to mourn silently because he felt that was a means of respecting Sarah. Okay, so he tells the children of Heth, I am an alien and a resident among you. Whose land was this supposed to be? This is the land of Canaan. And yet, Abraham is coming through this land. He's saying, okay, I'm an alien and a resident among you. Grant me an estate for a burial site with you that I may bury my dead from before me. And so what's he doing? He's coming to them. And he's making a request, right? He's not demanding anything. He just says, well, I'm a, I'm a resident here. I'm an alien. I'm not part of you people. But could you do me this favor, right? So he's coming humbly to them, right? So he can bury Sarah. Okay, Gary, could you go ahead and read verse... Uh, Five and six there. And the sons of Heth answered and said to Abraham, Hear us, our Lord, you are a prince of God among us. Bury your dead in the choicest of our sepulchers. None of us will withhold from you his sepulcher for the burial of your dead. Hmm. So what are, what are they saying here? They're actually calling Abraham a prince, right? Mm -hmm. So, does, it, does that show that they have respect for Abraham? Yeah. Yeah. They, they respect, but what do they respect about Abraham? I think they, mm -hmm. they'd already heard about Abraham. Yeah. Yeah. They, they knew him. They knew of him. And they knew of him before he even got there, and now he was a resident in their yeah, land. Right. And they saw how the Lord blessed him and blessed everything that he had. And uh, so he's what? He's the Prince of God. Okay. Leonardo, could you go ahead and read verse 7 through 9? Then, it, then Abraham got up and bowed down to the people of the land, to the sons of Heth, and spoke with them, saying, If you are of a mind to let me bury my dead from before my presence, listen to me. Plead with Ephron, son of Sophar, on my behalf, that he may give me the cave of Machupala. 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 That belongs to him. That, that is at the end of his field. At the full price, let him give it to me in your midst for a gravesite. For a, for a gravesite. Okay, so he's going to. Okay, he rose and bowed down to the members and says here in the Kumash, the members of the council. So he's before the elders of the city. 
right, the leaders, the leaders of the city. And he doesn't go straight to Ephron himself, does he? he? He wants an intermediary. He wants somebody else to go talk to him first, right? So he's trying to say, okay, he has gratitude to the people. He specifies what plot of land that he wanted. And why would Abraham want the cave of Machpelah? Because Adam and Eve was already buried there. Because he knew, because I believe Abraham knew that Adam and Eve were already buried there and that it was a special place. And they say that that cave actually had an upper and a lower chamber. And so it had enough area for all of the people to be buried in. And he said, uh, that he told those interceding for him, let him grant it to me for its full price. And they knew, okay, Ephron knew that Abraham was a wealthy man, that Abraham was rich, right? Well, how rich was he? Well, we're going to find out in a minute. Okay, Brian, uh, could you go ahead and read verse 10, okay. 11, 12, and 13? It may take you a little while, but just go for it. Okay, can you? You can do it. I don't know. And he, Ephraim. And he, Ephraim, dwell among the children of, of, of Heth and Ephraim and the Hittite. What? The Hittite. The Hittite answered Abraham and in the audience, audience of the children of Heath, of Heath, even all of all that went in at the gate of his city, saying, Nay, my Lord, hear me, my field giveth thee, and the cave, 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 the cave that is therein, I give it thee, and the prince, presence, presence of the son of my people, I give it thee in the presence, and Abraham bowed down himself before the people of the land. One more. Okay. And he spoke to Ephraim in the audience, the audience of the people of the land, saying, but if thou wilt give it, I pray thee, hear me, and I will give thee money for the field. It take of me, and I will bury my dead there. Okay, so now here, what are they doing? They're negotiating, right? Yep. And uh, this is a familiar familiar thing here. Where where are they doing this negotiating? According to the city. According to the according to the Kumash, according to the Hebrew translation, says that Ephron was sitting in the midst of the children of Heth, so he was there with the council, and they're sitting in the gate of the city. And what did the uh, children of Israel do later on when they set up the land of Canaan, when they had their cities and they had their judges? It, it was a common practice in that day that the leaders of the city, the elders of the city, whenever a business transaction was done, the council would meet at the gates of the city and the people would be there, the council would be there to be witnesses of the transaction, right? So they would have witnesses that were there. Okay, and they're, they're negotiating right in front of everybody, so they have all the witnesses there. 
Okay, Beth, could you go ahead and read verse 11 through 20, 14 through 20? And Ephraim answered Abraham, saying unto him, My Lord, hearken unto me. The land is worth four hundred shekels of silver. What is that betwixt me and thee? Bury there, bury therefore thy dead. And Abraham hearkened unto Ephraim, and Abraham weighed to Ephraim the silver which he had named in the audience of the sons of Heath. Four hundred shekels of silver, current money with the merchant. And the field of Ephraim, which was in... <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> which was in Machpil. That's Mac right. Mac 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 which yeah. was before <laughs> Manry. The field and the cave, which were therein, and all the trees that were in the field, that, that were in all the borders round about, were made sure. And to Abraham for a possession in the presence of the children of Heth, before all that went in at the gate of the, his city. And after this, Abraham buried Sarah, his wife, in the cave of the field of Montpelier. Uh -huh. Before Manre, the same is Hebron, in the land of Canaan. And the field and the cave that is therein were made sure unto Abraham for a possession of a burying place by the sons of Heath. Yeah. Okay, the sons of Heath. So it was made sure as a burial site. Does anybody know what this uh, 400 shekels of silver was? <coughs> Actually, what they say, okay, what do you have there? No, I, I, Angela was laying there. <laughs> she was. Uh, you know, uh, 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 um, well, it's like a million dollars, right? Okay, they call it they, 400 silver shekels. It wasn't just the regular silver, silver shekels, but they called it a centenaria which is actually equal to 2,500 regular shekels. And so in effect, what they say is that for the land and the cave, the field and the cave, Abraham actually paid one million shekels. Bought his own land. Yeah, a million shekels. A million shekels yeah. to buy the field and the cave. Buying his own field. <laughs> Buying his own field because it's in his own land, the yeah. land of Canaan. So well, I guess nobody so can argue that it's his then after he pays for it. Uh, well, they still try to argue. Uh, They're doing that right now. Uh, but but what happens here is that you go through this. And it says, this illustrates Abraham's love for Sarah. He chose the finest burial site for her and did not haggle over the price. The Midrash states that this is one of three places where scripture attests to the Jews' uncontestable possession of the Holy Land. The cave of Machpelah, the site of the temple, which was the threshing floor of Aruna that David bought, and the tomb of Joseph were all purchased without bargaining and paid for with legal tender. So those are the three places that were purchased. Okay, the cave of Machpelah with the field, Joseph's tomb, and the temple now. And all three of them today are being disputed, right? Mm -hmm. And right here in the scripture, it shows that the Jewish people have title to all those places. And all three of them is held under Muslim control. Yeah. So that's chapter 23. Now we'll go to chapter 24. We'll get back with Angela again. And uh, verse 1 through 4. Now Abraham was old, well on in years, and Hashem had blessed Abraham with everything. And Abraham said to his servant, the elder of his household, who controls all that is his, Place now your hand under my thigh, and I will have you swear by Hashem, God of heaven and God of earth, 
that you not take a wife for my son from the daughters of the Canaanites, among whom I dwell. Rather, to my land and to my kindred, you shall go and take a wife for my son, for Isaac. For Isaac. Okay. So now, who's, who's this servant that the scripture is talking about? Okay, that an angel would say that the servant is Eliezer. But they never name him. But they don't name him here, but that's that's who they say it is. Is they say it is Eliezer. They say. Who's they? The sages. Okay. <laughs> but they don't really know. Okay. No. But it's the most logical because Eliezer was the one that was with Abraham for the whole time. He was his servant. He was his servant. And there's something else here. Abraham tells him to place his hand under his thigh to, to make this oath. Now, what, what's he talking about here? To swear, to swear or to... Oh. Okay, what, what he was doing, the most important thing, the covenant... The covenant that God gave Abraham was the circumcision. And so what they were saying, when, when Abraham told Eliezer to place his hand on his thigh, okay, he was making an oath that was based on the covenant of the circumcision. So that he would have to follow through and do everything that Abraham had asked him to do because he couldn't violate the covenant. Oh yeah, it says thigh is a euphemism. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And he tells him, do not take a wife for my son from the daughters of the Canaanites, but go to the land of my kindred shall you go and take a wife for my son Isaac. Okay, so here, like we talked about before, he wants to have a division here. He's not going to have his son Isaac marry from any of the other nations and people. He has to go, Eliezer has to go back to their homeland and find somebody within the family to get for Isaac as a wife. And you're going to see a picture wasn't, here. Huh? Wasn't his family idol worshippers? Mm -hmm. Yeah. But there, there's been some changes in there because actually when he, when he goes back, there's, there's people there. And... Uh, Actually, they have godly characteristics, some of them. He knows them. They, they know. So, and so, okay. Go ahead, Gary, verse uh, 5 through 8. And the servant said to him, Suppose the woman will not be willing to follow me to this land. Must I then take your son back to the land from which you came? Abraham said to him, Beware that you do not take my son thither again. The Lord God of heaven, who took me from thence, from my father's household, from the land of my kindred, and who spoke to me, and who made a covenant with me, saying, To your descendants will I give this land. He shall send his angel before you, and you shall take a wife of my son from me. From there... And if the woman will not be willing to follow you, then you shall be clear from this smile. Only you must not take my son there again. So, okay. Don't take my son there again, right? Right. right. Where, where was Isaac born? He was born in, Canaan, in the land yeah, of Canaan. Canaan. Mm -hmm. And Canaan was the land that was promised to Abraham and his offspring. Yeah. He didn't want Isaac leaving the land of Canaan yeah. for no reason. No reason because Isaac was to inherit the land, right? That was part of the covenant. So Isaac wasn't supposed to leave the land. 
And so he told Eliezer to go where? To go back to the land, to his, to where his family was. I felt it interesting that he said he would, that the Lord would send his angel before That's you. Right. So, so he had that assurance somehow. I, don't, I was curious. Abraham about knew. Yeah. And also Abraham knew. It says, he says here, if the woman will not wish to follow you, you shall then be absolved of this oath of mine. But he knew. He knew that Eliezer would not be absolved from this oath because he knew that the Lord would lead Eliezer right to the right woman. Okay. Um, Brian, go ahead and read verse... Uh, what verse? Verse 9 and 10. Okay, okay. And here we'll see the number 10 again. Yeah. And Abraham... No, verse 9 of verse. chapter 24. Oh, chapter 24, verse 9. Yeah. Okay. Okay. And and the servant put his hand upon under, under the high thigh. the thigh of Abraham, his master, and swear unto him concerning. concerning that matter. And the servant took the ten camels of of the camels of his master and departed for all the goods of his master were his hand, in his hand, in his hand. And, and he arose and went to Mesopotamia. What's that word? Mesopotamia. Mesopotamia. That's kind of tricky. Mesopotamia. <laughs> 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 and to the city of Nahor. Nahor. Okay. So now he's going all the way to the city of who? Nahor. 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 Who was Nahor? Abraham's brother. Abraham's brother. Yeah, Abraham's brother. He was a brother, right? Yeah. Okay. So we go on. Now we know what? We know that... So, so he's going back, and he's actually going to the city of Nahor, which is who? Abraham's brother. Brother, okay. Okay, and he has ten camels, and he has some gifts with him, right? A bunch of them. A bunch of them. <laughs> okay. Uh, Beth, can you go ahead and read verse 11 through 13? And he well, made, go, go ahead and read 11 through 14. And he made his camels to kneel down without the city, by a well of water at the time of the evening, even the time that women go out to draw water. And he said, O Lord God of my master Abraham, I pray thee, send me good speed this day, and show kindness unto my master Abraham. Behold, I stand here by the well of water, and the daughters of the men of the city come out to draw water. And let it come to pass that the damsel to whom I shall say, let down thy pitcher, I pray thee, that I may drink. And she, and she shall say, Drink, and I will give thy camels drink also. Let the same be she that thou hast appointed for thy servant Isaac, and thereby shall I know that thou hast showed kindness unto my master. Okay. So, who usually goes out to draw the water? 
The women usually go up, but what women go out to draw the water? The young ones. Yeah, okay. <laughs> but, but which young ones? The virgins, the, the daughters if, of the... If the people have any kind of money, who goes and gets the water? The servants so do, right? Yeah. The, the servants do, right? Yeah. And so, Eliezer was looking for a bride for Isaac, somebody that had the heart of a servant, right? Mm -hmm. Somebody that wasn't, um, let's say, taken up by the things that were in the world, right? Mm -hmm. Or somebody that was rich that thought, well, these menial tasks are beneath me, and I don't need to do this. My servant can go and do this. Eliezer was looking for somebody that was a servant, that, that was willing to work, that that would be a good match for his master's son. So he wasn't looking out to look for somebody that was rich or wealthy, that had a bunch of servants that wasn't willing to do anything except sit around and wait, wait for everybody else to do everything for him, right? And, uh, and he's, so he's by the spring of water, and the people are coming out to draw water. And uh, the place that the servant went back to is called the Ram Naharim, which uh, is between the pair of rivers between the uh, Euphrates and Tigris rivers. So that's the land that they went back to where Nahor was. Okay, so what was he doing? He was checking out what the girl, the woman's character, right? Now we know at this time that, okay, Abraham had gone to sacrifice Isaac. We know he didn't have to. The ram was caught in the thicket. We know at that time that Isaac was 37 years old. At this particular time, now he's about 40. So he's basically disappeared for about three years since Abraham went to, to sacrifice him, and that'll come in, in a little bit. Okay, now we'll go, uh, Angela, could you go ahead and read verse 15 to 18? And it was when he had not yet finished speaking that suddenly Rebecca was coming out. She who had born had been born to Bethuel, Bethuel, the son of Milcah, the wife of Nahor, brother of Abraham, with her jug upon her shoulder. Now the maiden was very fair to look upon, a virgin whom no man had known. She descended to the spring, filled her jug, and ascended. The servant ran toward her and said, Let me sip, if you please, a little water from your jug. She said, Drink, my lord, and quickly she lowered her jug to her hand and gave him a drink. Okay, so she was coming out to the water. Okay, she's, what, a virgin, fair to look upon, and according to their calculations, they say at this particular time, Rebecca was only about 14 years old. Okay, so she was very, very young. Now the other thing here, they say that um, Eliezer was the Rosh Yeshiva who was the head of the school who taught all of Abraham's servants. So he was the head of the yeshiva. Okay, now, also what, Eliezer was the one that was sent out, and the one sent out is called a shaliach, which means a sent one, 
or in the New Testament terms, a shaliot, a shaliot would be like an apostle, the, the one sent out. The name Eliezer means God of help. And Abraham gave him instructions to find a suitable mate for Isaac by going back to Haran to Abraham's people. Okay, so we're going to start to see a picture in here now. Another thing that Rebecca does here, we see here, what did she do with that jug of water? When Eliezer asked for a drink. She lowered it and gave it him a drink. Okay, so she didn't hand him the jug and say, okay, have a drink of water, Eliezer. What did she do? She, she poured it in his mouth for yeah. him, right? She held the jug and gave him a drink of water. It's a beautiful love story. <laughs> Okay, she lowered the jug to her hand and gave Eliezer a drink. I love it. Okay, Angela, go ahead and read verse 19 through 23. You want me to read it? Yeah. This is awesome, partner. Okay. When she finished giving him a drink, she said, I will draw water even for your camels until they have finished drinking. So she hurried and emptied her jug into the trough and kept running to the well to draw water. And she drew for all his camels. The man was astonished at her, reflecting silently to know whether Hashem had made his journey successful or not. And it was. When the camels had finished drinking, the man took a golden nose ring, it weigh, its weight was a becca, and two bracelets on her arms. Ten gold shekels was their weight. And he said, Whose daughter are you? Pray tell me. Is there room in your father's house for us to spend the night? Okay, now, so she doesn't, what, what do you see here first, here in verse 19? She, she doesn't ask Eliezer if his camels need a drink, does she? Mm -mm. Mm -mm. She just goes and does it. Yeah. She just says, after he finished drinking, she said, I will draw water for your camels until they have finished drinking. So, she didn't even ask him if, if he wanted the camels watered or not, she just went ahead and did it, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Camels, ten camels would drink a lot of water. Well, let's let's think about this now because we know how much water these camels drink. Uh, the the other th thing is here is that she didn't water the camels one at a time, did she? Because, because, because how do you figure out which camel to water first if there's ten of them? She's poured it in the trough. So she's pouring the water from her jug into a trough so that all ten camels can start to drink at the same time. Okay, how many, how much water does a camel drink? A lot. Okay, you say a lot. Does anybody know? They got a big hump to put it in. They got a big hump, Angela says. Okay. How, how much water do the camels drink, Gary? Any idea? Oh, I read in Kumash, but I forgot. <laughs> but you forgot. Like 12 okay. gallons per, per camel, wasn't that right? 14. Close. Yeah. It's okay. Angela's got the right number. All right. They, they right. say that a camel can drink 14 gallons of water. How big was her pitcher? 14 gallons. Yeah, of really. Water. How big was the pitcher, you think? I don't know. Okay, so you're talking 14 gallons of water per camel times 10. That's 140 gallons of water. She lowered her pitcher to the well and picked up the water and dumped it in the trough. At least, at least 140 gallons. So it could have been five. And gallons. remember. And remember, she's running back and forth 
from the well to the trough. They're not right next to each other. She said when she lowered it, uh, where was it? Did she carry it on her shoulder or on her head? She carried it somewhere. And we don't know how big this pitcher was, but, but she dumped 140 gallons of water in this trough and she ran back and forth to the well. She was like superwoman. Yeah. Okay, who else did we see run? A couple of Torah portions ago. Uh -huh. Who ran? Who ran? Abraham. When he was talking with yeah, Hashem and Abraham. the three visitors came and he yes. ran to the three visitors. Oh, right after he was circumcised. Right after he was circumcised. And now you're seeing the same picture again with one of his relatives, right? Mm -hmm. And so she's running back and forth from the well to the trough, dumping pitchers of water in to water all of these camels. So here you're talking a lot of water. Now here there's a midrash in verse 16 where we go back where she says um, she descended to fill her jug and ascended. And it says she filled her jug and ascended. Unlike the other girls at the well who wasted their time in idle chatter and gossip, Rebecca did her task quickly without delay. She filled her jug and immediately ascended. So also Eliezer got to notice there that she was about her business or work, taking care of her business, and she wasn't just standing around chit-chatting with everybody else, she was doing her work. Okay, the Midrash interprets the word ascent of this phrase as a reference not to Rebecca, but to the water, rendering that she filled her jug and the water ascended to meet her. So great was her virtue that miracles happened when she came to the well. So that when she lowered her jug to the water, the water just went in the jug and she brought it back. <laughs> Was there this well like, uh, did, they, did they have steps down into it, or did it lower, did they lower they, the jug? It doesn't specify here. Some wells they had to lower a bucket into, and then dump it into the pitcher. Some they had steps down into the well and they dipped the jug in the water. Well, if she descended, then she was going down. Down. It says she descended. Well, it says ascended here. She filled her jug and ascended, which means she would have descended. Okay, so she filled her jug and ascended. And they say after that, it says, Rebecca acted in a most exalted manner. She lowered the jug herself to spare Eliezer the effort. She actually brought the jug near his mouth so he would not even have to hold it. Furthermore, she did not say at this point that she would water the camels as well because if Eliezer had known he might want to drink too quickly or too little to spare her the extra effort. So she let him think that all she would do was give him a bit of water. And then she went and gave all the camels water. So she didn't even get a, give him a chance to change his mind or make it easy on her. She just went and watered all the camels. Okay, and they say here that after the miracle of the ascending water, the water stopped and she had to physically draw all the water for all the camels. Sheer physical exertion. And this was the proof of her kindness. Ten camels would consume at least 140 gallons of water. That Rebecca would undertake such a strenuous task so eagerly for a total stranger was an indication that Eliezer had asked. And she responded to the request for personal lodging as well by saying she would provide for him and all the camels. And so all of these different things that he gave her here represent something. Okay.
if there's a lot in this. Okay, so you have a beaker is what? A half shekel. It's a half a shekel. Yeah. And a half shekel was what? Later on in, in the history of Israel, the half shekel was the temple tax, right? Mm -hmm. that, that everybody had to give to the temple. Okay, what else do we see here? We see that Eliezer gave her all of these things before he even found out who she was or who her family was, right? The two bracelets? Huh? The two bracelets are the tablets of the law. Right, the bracelets represented the tablets of the law. Keep going. And their weight of ten shekels symbolizes the Ten Commandments. Symbolizes the Ten Commandments, right. That's all I see. Okay, that, and, and that's what you have there, okay? So, so she's wearing what? The symbols, the half shekel temple tax, oh, the, the Ten Commandments. Cool. Okay. And so Eliezer gave her these gifts before he even knew who she was. Which was all by what? All by the leading of the Spirit, right? It says that an angel, that an angel would go before Eliezer, right? And set everything up. She must have been curious about that. That seemed like a pretty extravagant gift for Mm -hmm. For just watering the camels, mm -hmm. even though she had work mm -hmm. in it. And after she quickly get, said yes, though. And after, and after, yeah. and, and Eliezer doesn't even ask her yet who she is. And he said, who, finally, Eliezer says, what? Okay, yes, the beaker uh, gives her the two bracelets on her arm, the ten gold shekels, and then he says, whose daughter are you? What an engagement ring. Pray tell me, is there room in your father's house for us to spend the night? Now remember, Eliezer has ten camels with him, and I'm sure Eliezer has a bunch of servants with him too. Okay, so it's not just Eliezer, he's got people with him probably, but it doesn't mention in the scripture. Okay, Gary, go ahead and read verse 24 through 27. And she said unto him, I am the daughter of Bethuel, the son of Milcah, whom she bore to Nahor. And she said moreover to him, We have plenty of straw and hay and room to lodge in. And the man knelt on the ground and worshipped the Lord. And he said, Blessed be the Lord God of my master Abraham, who has not will have held his grace and his truth from my master while I was on the road. The Lord led me to the house of my master's brother to take his brother's daughter to his son. Mm -hmm. So it's a perfect match, right? Mm -hmm. Exactly yeah. what Abraham asked for, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Lamar, you want to go ahead and read verse 28 to 31? Then the young woman ran and told her mother's house these things. Now Rebekah had a brother, and his name was Laban. And Laban ran outside to the man at the spring. As soon as he saw the nose ring and the bracelets on his sister's hand, and when he heard the words of Rebekah, his sister, saying, Thus the man said to me, he went to the man. There he was, standing by the camels at the, at the spring. So he said, Come in, blessed of Adonai. Why are you standing outside when I have tidied up the house and there is room for the camels? Okay. That, that, uh, there it says, uh, Blessed of Adonai. So it indicates that they possibly were uh, worshipers. They, they right? knew. Yeah. They knew. They knew. So, 
So it says what that Rebecca ran to who? Her mother. Or her to her mother. mother. And what they said was that back in that time, that the women had their own tents. They they would separate from the men. So so since Rebecca was the daughter, she ran to her mother to tell her everything that the stranger had said to her. So, he told, so she told her mother's household and then the information spread to the rest of the family. Okay, so the man entered the house and unmuzzled the camels. He gave strong feed for the camels and ordered to bathe his feet and the feet of the men who were with him. And food was set before him, but he said, I will not eat until I have spoken my peace. Okay, now, so Eliezer enters the house, okay, it says that he had other men with him, and it says that Eliezer unmuzzled the camels. And basically what they said here was that wherever Abraham's animals traveled, they always kept them muzzled so that they would never eat of anyone else's pasture or fields that he would provide his own feed for his own animals or buy whatever feed he needed to take care of the animals. And he made sure all his animals were muzzled just to make sure that none of his animals would eat from anybody else's fields without him knowing it. Like a respect thing? Or? Huh? Like a respect thing? Yeah, to, to respect all those around him. Okay. And so they, so they fed the camels, and they washed their feet, and they did everything, and they set the meal. And now Eliezer is going to tell the reason for his journey. And so Laban here, who's kind of taken over things, tells Eliezer, okay, go ahead and speak. Eliezer didn't want to eat until the whole process was complete. Okay, Beth, go ahead and read verse uh, 34 to 41. And he said, I am Abraham's servant, and the Lord hath blessed my master greatly, and he has become great, and he hath given his flocks and herds, and he is, and he hath given him flocks and herds and silver and gold and men servants and maid servants and camels and asses. And Sarah, my wife, master's wife, bare a son to my master when she was old, and unto him hath he given all that he hath. And my master made me swear, saying, Thou shalt not take a wife to my son of the daughters of the Canaanites, in whose land I dwell, but thou shalt go into my, unto my father's house and to my kindred, and take a wife unto my son. And I said unto my master, Preadventure the woman would not follow me. And he said unto him, The Lord before whom I walk will send his angel with thee, and prepare the way, and thou shalt take a wife for my son of my kindred and of my father's house. Then shalt thou be clear from, from this my oath when thou comest to my kindred, kindred. And if they give not thee one, Thou shalt be clear from my oath. Mm -hmm. Okay, so here, what's he saying? He's talking about what Abraham told him to do. And Abraham told him the angel would go before him and prepare the way, and everything would be all set up, right? And it was. And it was. Okay, Andrew, we'll go ahead and read verse 42. Through 46. Okay. 42 through 46. I came today to the spring and said, Hashem, God of my master Abraham, if you would graciously make successful the way on which I go, behold, I am standing by the spring of water. Let it be the young woman who comes out to draw and to whom I shall say, please give me some water to drink from your jug. And 
and who will answer, you may drink, and I will draw waters, water for your camels too. And she, she shall be the woman whom Hashem has designated for my master's son. I had not yet finished meditating when suddenly Rebecca came out with a jug on her shoulder and descended to the spring and drew water. Then I said to her, Please give me a drink. She hurried and lowered her jug and upon jug from her upon herself and said, Drink, and I will even water your camels. So I drank and she watered the camels also. Okay. Gary, go ahead and read verse 47 through 49. And I asked her and said, Whose daughter are you? And she said, The daughter of Bethuel, the son of Nahor whom Melka bore to him. And I put the earrings on her ears, the bracelets on her hands. And I knelt and worshiped the Lord and blessed the Lord God of my master, Abraham, who had led me to the right way to the house of my master's brother to take my master's brother, brother's daughter to his son. 49 to yeah. And now if you will deal kindly and truly with my master, tell me, and if not, tell me so that I may know what to do. Okay. So here he's what? He's retelling the whole story of everything that happened at the spring, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, Leonardo, verse uh, 50 to 54. 50 to what? Verse 50 to 54. Then, they, <clears throat> then Laban and Bethel answered, and they said, The matter proceeds from Adonai. We cannot speak to you bad or good. Rebekah is before you. Take her and go, and let her become a wife for, your, for our master's son, just as Adonai has spoken. Now, when Abraham's servant heard these words, he bowed down to the ground to Adonai. Then the servant brought out articles of silver and gold and garments and gave them to Rebekah. He also gave precious gifts to her brothers and to her mother. Then they ate and drank, he and the men who were with him, and spent the night. When they arose in the morning, he said, Send me off to my master. Okay. So, based on what Eliezer told Laban and Bethuel, They're saying what? They answered, the matter stemmed from Hashem. So, we can't say... We had good luck. <laughs> says, here Rebecca's before you, take her and go. Well, we're gonna, we're gonna get in, we're gonna get in Hashem's way? I don't think so, right? <laughs> Because they saw that it was all from the Lord, right? Mm -hmm. Right. That the Lord set everything up. It was His. It was His plan. And if you look at this, it says, "Here, Rebecca is before you. Take her and go, and let her be a wife to your master's son." They didn't even ask her, did they? <laughs> Okay, uh, Brian, uh -huh. 55 and, what chapter and 56, chapter 24. Okay. 55 through what? I got verses. Uh, 55 and 56 and 57. Okay. Okay, uh, first chapter 24. Chapter 24, you got it? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Verse 57. Verse 50, 55. 55 50. through 57. Yeah. 50, okay. 55. Okay. And her brother and, and her mother said, Let 
the man so a, the damsel. A damsel abide. Abide with us a few days. At the least ten after she shall go. And and he said unto them, Hinder. Hinder me not, seeking the Lord hath prospered, prospered my way. S send me a way that I may go unto my master. Fifty-seven. Okay. And they said, we, we will call the damsel a choir. And inquire. Huh? And inquire. And inquire at her mouth. Yeah. Okay, so you're going to ask now for Rebecca's decision. Before, they didn't say that, did they? Mm -hmm. No. They just said, take her and go, right? And now, actually, what it says here in the Hebrew says, let the maid remain with us a year or ten months. Wow. Oh, man. A year or ten months. And, of course, Eliezer is not going to go along with that. And so, Beth, go ahead and read uh, verse 58 to the end of the chapter there. And they called Rebekah and said unto her, Wilt thou go with this man? And she said, I will go. And they sent away Rebekah, their sister, and her nurse, and Abraham's servant, and his men. And they blessed Rebekah, and said unto her, Thou art our sister, be thou the mother of thousands of millions, and let thy seed possess the gate of those that hate them. And Rebekah arose, her damsels, and they rode upon the camels, and followed the men, and the servant took Rebekah and went his way. And Isaac came from the way of the well, Leholroy, for he dwelt in the south country, and Isaac went out to meditate in the field at the eventide. And he lifted up his eyes, and saw, and behold, the camels were coming. And Rebekah lifted up her eyes, and when she saw Isaac, she lighted off the camel. For she had said unto the servants, What man is this that walketh in the field to meet us? And the servant had said, It is my master. Therefore she took a veil and covered herself. And the servant told Isaac all things that he had done. And Isaac brought her into his mother's mother Sarah's tent. And took Rebekah, and she became his wife, and he loved her. And Isaac was comforted after his mother's death. Okay, now there's a lot to look at here. <laughs> okay. So Rebekah makes a decision, right? What does she say? She says she's going to go. Now, how old is Rebekah? Well, they, they say she was about 14 years old. And now she's going to go with her nurse. Okay, and they're going to have Abraham's servant and his men, and she's going to travel all this distance with all of these men, and she's only 14 years old. So she made the decision. Okay, Rebecca rose with her maidens, they rode on the camels and proceeded after the men, and now they're coming, and there's a lot of there's a lot of things in here. They're coming to where Isaac is. And Isaac is out in the field, and actually they say that when Rebecca saw Isaac, she fell off the camel. According to the sages, she fell off the camel, and they say actually what happened was after Abraham 
went through the Akeda, the binding of Isaac. After that, Isaac disappears for three years, and they say that Isaac actually went to paradise. And that when Rebekah was on her camel and saw Isaac and asked, who is that man out in the field, that she really saw Isaac returning from paradise and fell off the camel. And so what we have there is a picture. We have Abraham as a picture of Hashem, the father. And Eliezer is a picture of the Holy Spirit. And Isaac is a picture of the sun coming back from paradise or heaven. And the sun is coming back. Okay, Isaac is a type of Yeshua. And it's a picture of Yeshua the Mashiach coming back to get his bride, the believers, who are represented by Rebecca. Okay, and that's, that's the parallel there. So Abraham represents Hashem, Isaac represents Yeshua the Mashiach, and Rebecca represents the bride of the Mashiach, which is all the believers. Okay. And as uh, Isaac is walking in the field, he's meditating. And what do they say that is? Well, that's the reason. Okay, that it goes back. It says, from this description that Isaac prayed before nightfall, the Talmud in Barakos 26b and the Midrash derives the tradition that Isaac instituted the Minka, the afternoon prayer. Abraham instituted the Shakarit, the morning prayer, which is in uh, Genesis 19.27, and Jacob instituted the Ma'ariv, the evening prayer, which is in Genesis chapter 28, verse 11. Okay, so here you have the parallel, you see the picture, the Father, the Son, the Bride, and the Holy Spirit all working, coming together. And it's a picture of what? The Bride and the Bridegroom and the Wedding Supper. Put the whole thing all together. Another thing we have here is they say that Sarah's tent... always had a lamp burning in it. Now you remember Abraham and Sarah were what? They were always ready to have visitors and to minister to travelers and to take care of people. It says, as long as Sarah was alive, a lamp burned in her tent from one Sabbath Eve to the next. All her dough was blessed and a cloud hung over her tent which represented the Shekinah. So the glory of God rested over Sarah's tent. Okay? The glory of God, the light of God, rested over Sarah's tent the whole time Sarah was alive. But they say that when Sarah died, that the light was out, the cloud was gone, and there was nothing there. And how Isaac knew for sure that Rebekah was the right one was that when he took Rebekah into his mother's tent, the lamp was lit, the dough was blessed, and the glory cloud came back to the tent. <laughs> And thus Isaac was consoled for his mother. Now another thing you see here about Rebekah, when Isaac was out in the field, what did she do in verse 65? 
She took a veil and covered herself, showing what? Modesty, right? So, you know, based on all these things, we know that Rebecca was what? She was a faithful servant. She was willing to be obedient to the Spirit. She was willing to go through dangerous places. She was willing to what? To work hard and do what was right. So it appears that, that, that Sarah's tent became Rebecca's at that point. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. And, and so here, what we have is the new beginning. This is the beginning of the next generation now with Isaac and Rebecca. And who comes after from Isaac and Rebecca? Who's the next one? Should I get the have Jacob and Esau coming up next, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, I think we need to stop here because it's about 8.30.